Happy New Year. I'm Emmanuel Xavier, and you're watching Out at the Center. Let's do it. It's an election year. Do you know how your representative has voted on our issues? Now is a good time to find out how the candidates and current office holders stand on laws that affect us in the LGBT community. New York State Assembly member Daniel O'Donnell came to the center to talk about why he feels it is important to be out as a politician, why the marriage bill is important for the human rights of New Yorkers, and why you should find out how your representative voted to either thank them or let them know about your position. After 27 years, we are still together. It's a fairly unique story when I tell people I met my partner the first day of college at Catholic University of America. I'm not sure that Catholic University of America is so proud of that, but that's the way it is. When I got to the assembly, I made a calculated decision that I was going to be very upfront and open about my, my relationship. I knew that it was imperative if I was going to convince my colleagues that I should be treated like them, that I had to show them my life and my relationship. And so from day one, um, John has been in Albany a lot. Um, and he comes to me to events and we go out to dinner with my colleagues and they come to my house for dinner. And so it's very important, had been very important for, for me to show me and my life as a, actually reflective of the way I am. John and I love each other with all our hearts. Um, and the only reason why I want to get married is to know that he, should something happen to me, would be fully protected under the law. And I have signed every paper and written every form and done everything I know how to do. And I'm a lawyer, and I therefore know how to do that. Um, but I still know that all of that is subject to interpretation and questioning in a way that a marriage license is not. All civil rights struggles have, have evolved primarily from the court-based thing. If, when Mildred Loving was, won her case in, the, in 1967, a, a poll of the country s said 70-30 that they thought that the law was, was the right thing to do. You can't rely on a popular vote over people's civil rights or human rights. And so this is a civil right, human rights issue. And so I think that the, the, the Constitution of the state of New York says that I'm being deprived of due process and equal protection because I can't have something that somebody else can have. And so I always think that the court route is the better route because it should not be subject to popular will. Having said that, having lost in the courts and the court saying it was our job, I said, okay, that's my job and that's what I'll try to do. There, there are hundreds of thousands of gay people who are married in New York. They're married in Massachusetts. They were married in, in Canada. They're married places where, and their marriages are respected and treated as marriages under New York law. And so therefore, at some point, you know, how can it be rational that a couple can fly to Montreal and get married, but somebody can't get married in Central Park? It doesn't make any sense. And so eventually, what will happen, I think, there'll be so many people out there who are, in fact, treated as married under the law that that scenario where the court said, no, we didn't really mean it, could never come to be. Where are you from? Who do you know? Where does your sister live? Where does your brother live? Where does your best friend live? I mean, you know, we don't all live on, I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, right? So people in your life who may be represented by somebody who voted yes, a letter from a constituent means more than a letter from a non-constituent. Um, I hate to say nice things about Republicans because I don't think very nice things about them, but I have to tell you that there are probably 15 or 20 more votes out there. My Republican colleagues, many of them said to me that they would be willing to vote yes, but their constituents don't want it. People are in their 60s, 70s, they often have a very difficult time wrapping their head around the concept. You talk to most, you talk to right wing 22 year olds, they can't care, they couldn't care less, okay? And where, where is it most popular in the state of New York? On Long Island. So all the Republican senators 
and the Republican assembly members who all vote no on this, how could that be? When, when 60 some odd percent of Long Islanders say that this should be the case. New Year is often a time to reflect and renew our inner paths and outer behaviors. A National Coming Out Day last year, Christian de la Huerta led a discussion about coming out and coming to terms with our spiritual side in a session for the Out and Faithful program. On behalf of the Out and Faithful Committee of the LGBT Center, we're very, very honored and pleased tonight to have Christian de la Huerta here with us. Christian is a world-known author and spiritual leader. We uh, really wanted Christian to come to talk about coming out spiritually um, on this particular day because this is National Coming Out Day. And Christian has really taken a really beautiful uh, aspect of coming out and brought it forth in this, in this book. And we thought it would be very appropriate to have Christian come share with us his wisdom and thoughts on this issue and topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for braving the, uh, the element and being here tonight. What does coming out spiritually mean to you in your case? Why are you here tonight? Why did you brave the rain uh, when there's so many other choices that you could have made tonight? Just by you putting yourself at risk and risk and rejection by saying that, yes, I had an image and experience of myself as part of the divine. Yeah, some people will judge it, but who knows what effect that could have on someone else. We also tend to think of coming out as something we do once, and, and that's not the case. We have to keep on doing it, and we do it every time, um, whenever we have to make a choice to come out to a different person. And I said that coming out and coming out spiritually is an act of courage. It's coming to a point in our lives where we have said, you know, that's it. I must be who I am. What is most significant in terms of changing somebody's mind about how they view um, gay, lesbian people, uh, is when they know somebody personally. But last year they did a study where now they know, now they have the numbers. And that it's not until a person knows like four or five, sometimes six, um, LGBT people that then they, they're, they're thinking, they're, they're, they begin to value them in a different way. I haven't told my ex. We're not we're close anymore, but you know, we still talk about once in a while, but he's such a devout atheist. I can't bring myself to tell him. I actually went for two years of seminary and more day. Thank you for sharing that. And um, so on October 11, 2007, National Coming Out Day, um, I would like to challenge you as a symbolic act to break through that crap, to just make a commitment that in your time frame, but before the end of the year, to come out to your ex. Like, <laughs> For goodness sake, like what do you have to lose? I know from many people that I've spoken to that they actually had, a, that it was more difficult for them to come out as spiritual beings to the gay and lesbian friends um, that it was for them to come out as gay or lesbian by trans to their friends and family. In the ultimate sense, coming out is about being ourselves. If that means coming out as a gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender person, then go for it. If it means coming out as an artist or a poet, when everyone around you thinks you should go to medical school or law school or trade school or make a lot of money, then go for what you really want. It may mean coming out as a spiritual person. In the ultimate sense, coming out from whichever closet is about healing ourselves. It means shedding the skins of our old identities of woundedness and victimization and emerging transformed as the beings that we really are, empowered, compassionate, loving, ready to make a difference in the world, and fully able to embrace the totality of life. When I fell in love, it completely changed everything. It was, I often use the analogy that it was a, as if I had been eating um, hamburger, and hot dogs is probably a more appropriate metaphor, um, all my life, and then somebody gave me a filet mignon. I remember, we'll never forget the first kiss. Um, I knew, I knew in my heart, in my mind, in my body and every cell and every part of my body that being gay wasn't wrong and it wasn't sinful and it wasn't an illness and it wasn't an abomination. And from that moment on, there wasn't a priest or minister or rabbi 
or an imam or a pope or a psychiatrist that could tell me otherwise. I guess I think of the divine as an exquisite swimming pool and the bunch of diving boards are around. And so the diving boards to me represent the different spiritual traditions. And to the degree that they're supporting us to dive into that, then they're doing their job. So thank you so much for being here tonight and I really appreciate your time and your participation. The fourth annual C Word was a time for lesbian, bi, and trans women to come together for support around cancer care and prevention. Dr. Florence Gello spoke about navigating the cancer journey on our own terms. So this is our fourth annual C Word to build community among us and take the cancer experience out of the medical and out of the difficult and bring people together in a more sort of upbeat setting. But now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Florence Gello, who has a private practice in which she specializes in grief, loss, and chronic illness. Well, I want to say um, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to be talking to you. There is a lot of interest in um, social work, nursing, to learn about the LGBT community. And, you know, we're here talking about cancer. That's an important feature because most of the medical establishment does not recognize all of these intersecting spheres. Doctors don't think about what family means. When family comes to mind, they think one husband, one wife, one and a half to two and a half children. And they don't think that family means created family, who has come into your life that's going to be there. That, but, but because they haven't thought of that, it also means that if you have a serious illness or when we have a serious illness, and you're in the hospital. You're dealing with the institutional prejudices that exist that means your partner can't be there with you, especially if a family member is contesting their right to be there. And there's differential treatment. It means less preventive care. Now, what does that mean? It means you don't go to the doctor to take care of yourself. And I talk to uh, you know lesbians about cancer, and I talk about the support services they have. The one thing they tell me often, more often than not, is they simply don't trust the medical establishment to take care of them well. And if they trust the medical establishment to take care of them well, they do so at another peril. And that is that they don't tell the, per the doctor or they don't tell the hospital that they're lesbian. They hide that. So that's not the way that we get the maximum care we're entitled to. So that, that's a call for a certain kind of activism. We want to find providers that are respectful to us. Next, we want an explanatory model. That means I want to be so informed about my health that I can make appropriate decisions for myself. I don't want you making decisions for me. I want to sit with you and make decisions together, ones that I believe are in my best interest and represent my highest ideal for my life and what I want to do with it. So there are ways in which we have to acknowledge who we are and what power we do hold. Even though in some other areas of our life we don't hold power, we have to acknowledge where it is and how we could best use it for the community. Empathy, it, you want that in your caregiver because that person has to recognize your situation and what the impact is on you ask you what your concerns and fears are, and in doing all of the above, establish what we call a therapeutic alliance. If I had one wish for our community, is that I think in a lot of ways, our presence has made a tremendous difference in the world in some ways, because the world is getting to stretch to be more embracing in some ways, even though life is hard still for many people for many reasons. If if we advance in this culture to be more embracing of difference, then it means that every one of us is going to f have to fight for a difference that is not our own. 
we're going to have to join other communities to gather together to do this work because there's you know there's a there's a story if you kill one person it's like killing all of us if you save one person it's like saving all of us I think we have to develop more and more of that kind of mentality that we're either all going to go there together or we're not going there at all there's a light burning bright showing me the way but I know where I've been there's a cry Ann Bannon's Bebo Brinker Chronicles are the basis for a new play of the same name previewing February 19th and opening March 5th at the 37 Arts Barishnikov Arts Center. Ann and the producer stopped by the center to talk about the production, being a lesbian in the 50s, and the historical context of the original story. Well, we want to do the whole lesbian canon, right? But where do you start? You start with Bebo Brinker. I go down. <laughs> so Kate said Bebo Brinker, and I said, absolutely, that's it, let's do it. Yeah, so I got to, I got to you through Jay. And so, you know, it's six degrees of lesbian separation, I think. So <laughs> yeah. it was great, though. That's how we started. When, when you have a character who's so beloved, or these characters are really beloved, is it sort of intimidating to think about, you know, putting them up on the, taking them from the one medium to the other, or? I don't think we were intimidated. I think it makes it easy, we're actually. Just, it makes yeah. it easier than if you're coming up with them for yourself. You know that they're already beloved. You know that people know who they are. So there's this recognition. I think what we tried to do was we tried to, to stay true to the characters that Anne had written. I don't think Anne was ahead of her time. You know, Anne was dealing with interracial relationships, artificial insemination, bisexuality, incest, all these things in her books way, 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 way before anybody has put it on logo. It's <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and you know, one of the things I think may be true of the books is that they, um, uh, yes, they are period pieces in, a, in terms of the culture. You know, what the kids then were wearing and how people were talking and, and the uh, political repression of the time, all that kind of stuff, which, which is still unfortunately not entirely unfamiliar. But I think what remains uh, true and a constant over the decades has been the uh, human emotion that the characters go through. And I think that strikes a chord of recognition among even the very younger viewers. The actors are, are putting their hearts into this, and we have superb people. They, they have performed a leap of faith. All of them are much younger than the era that they're portraying. But they, they have somehow been able to develop the insight and the understanding of what these characters were going through. And it's a big leap because 50 years ago, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a lot going on. There, people were terribly isolated, and we had no positive role models. And the entire medical and legal establishment was telling us that we were abnormal, and that all we needed was a good man to straighten us out, and you know, all that stuff. And so there was an awful lot of dissembling, and there was an awful lot of worry. It was tough, it really was. You could be arrested for being homosexual. Just that's all it took. If you were caught in a gay bar or you were holding hands with a same-sex partner in the paddy wagon, and in those days they used to print the honor roll the next day, and there you would be for disgracing yourself in public, and they didn't mince words, really. So. Um, what if your your spouse, if you had one, your mother, God forbid? It was way before the days of mom. Guess what? Um, but in spite of all that, gee, we had some wonderful, we had some flaming romances. We laughed. It, you know, I don't want people to get the impression it was all gloom and doom. You just had to keep looking over your shoulder. I guess you could think of it that way. I think one of the things that makes me the gladdest about having written these books, never, never quite understanding that they would resonate as they did with so many women, uh, is, is that in fact they did and they, they 
actually they informed young women of that era that they were not the only one in the world. And some of them really thought that. One of the things I'm really hoping is that this brilliant adaptation from the written medium to the theater uh, will we'll bring in a lot more people who, who will take the same kind of joy uh, that the books gave a lot of women in, in their first incarnation and feel good about themselves and see themselves validated. It's an interesting play, it's a lot of fun, and they've put five years of work into getting this just right, which they did. So I was, uh, I was just thrilled. Um, you can't ask for more than that. We have a stellar cast, brilliant playwrights, a wonderful director. It took half a century, but it was worth the wait. <laughs>David Halperin's book, What Do Gay Men Want, came out last year. He shared some of the thoughts that led him to write a book on the inner lives of gay men. My underlying concern, and I think it runs throughout the book, is how to describe the inner life of gay men and the inner life of sex. It now fits in with my current interests, which have to do with how to think and talk about the inner life of male homosexuality without having to do it through psychology. Uh, through psychology with its basically medical approach, normal versus pathological. It turns out that there is one area, at least, in which the topic of how we feel, what goes on in our inner lives, has not been closeted, but is the topic of obsessive concern. And that has to do with uh, gay men's sexual practices, especially their practices of risk, in the context of HIV AIDS. Turns out that there is an entire cottage industry of psychological work uh, by prevention activists, community leaders, and others that's designed to try to figure out what on earth goes on in our little minds and what explains why it is that we behave um, well in ways that uh, many people view as uh, dangerous, self-destructive, um, and, um, and generally sick. David Nimmons, who surveyed more than 60 behavioral studies published during the 1990s, reports that the proportion of gay men primarily behaving safely commonly hovers between 60 and 70 percent. By contrast, the percentage of heterosexual women and men practicing safe sex rarely reaches into the 30s. I think that what a lot of gay culture does is to allow us to occupy a certain kind of role or position that our society has created for women, but to do it in a particular kind of ironic way. I, I came out in a world in which basically we thought, I'm proud, this is probably a major slander on my generation or even just on the people I was hanging out with in San Francisco in the 70s, but I will, but I will say, I will just say that I think I came out at a time when people of my age thought that we didn't need gay culture because we had sex. We were really doing it. Uh, they were dreaming about, they, for them it was over the rainbow, somewhere over the rainbow, but we, we, for the first time, you know, we were really doing it. And um, now in a way I'm starting to wonder, well, what if being gay isn't about sex so much at all? What if it's really about Judy Garland? And that's all for this episode of Out at the Center. As the credits roll, we leave you with some highlights from the holiday party where the band Betty turned it out for Center volunteers. Center volunteers contribute to many programs at the Center, including the production of this TV show. I'm Emmanuel Xavier. Goodbye. My name is Richard Burns. I'm the center's executive director. And on behalf of everyone here at the center, we want you to know that this home for our queer community would not be possible without the work, the hard work of literally thousands of center volunteers and for the
financial support of thousands and thousands of Sarah members. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Betty! I feel a chill coming, but you don't need to care. Take off that coat, take off that hat, take off that ring, get Itchy fingers itchy, 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 let me pinch your pocket, itchy fingers itchy, 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 itchy